So let me flip to uh, one uh, other study. Series of, of uh, studies, actually, that I think is, is very um, in, instructive. So one of the things that we've looked at is uh, how, the, um, how the, the set of measures does relative to making some differential diagnoses. In other words, how folks with different psychological diagnoses performed on these measures. So for example, here we're looking at the uh, physical aggregate for the, uh, uh, the measure that basically the symptom measure of physical, cognitive, and emotional uh, abilities and, and coping. So we see here, for example, that in the physical domain, when people feel that they have physical issues um, on the intensity level and on the coping level, and you look at them from the standpoint of folks with no psychological diagnosis to an adjustment disorder, which is more of a, a mild to moderate type of disorder, to a somatoform like a chronic pain, to a major depressive disorder. And these are all pretty good ends, generally in the 100, somatoform 65, and you can clearly see a, a trend from the folks with no diagnosis coping satisfactorily with their uh, physical impairments and the intensity of their physical symptoms being less substantial. The folks with um, adjustment disorder not quite meeting satisfactory coping from the physical perspective and, and a more intense experience of physical impairments. And then as you get into the chronic pain group and the major depressive group, you see this trend continuing more and more departure from that notion of satisfactory coping and greater perceived intensity in the physical realm. You see the same thing occur from the emotional perspective. Again, no diagnosis through major depression. So you can see that there really is a good measure of uh, psychopathology It's picking up. It actually is differentiating among these, uh, these groups. And even from the cognitive perspective, so these, we've, we've ruled out folks that could actually have a true, so these are mainly um, folks with WSIB lifting type strain injuries, back injuries, they haven't hit their head. There's no traumatic brain injury. But in terms of their perception of their cognitive abilities, you can see the no diagnosis group, no issue, adjustment disorder, some cognitive pain group, and the major depression group, that much more substantial. So we begin to see very clearly the contribution, which we, we know, we know it from even the DSM, because some of the criteria involve cognitive symptoms relative to making a diagnosis of major depression, for example. But what's important about this, when, we, when there is no brain injury, is, is that aspect of, of giving bona fide credence. The fact that someone could have a physical impairment and or a psychological diagnosis, have cognitive difficulties, not be able to perform their job. So why is it that a neuropsychological or cognitive testing isn't appropriate? Why is it that we wouldn't give license to a neuropsychologist to comment on somebody who has major depression relative to their cognitive functions and how that manifests in terms of daily life and in terms of, and in terms of uh, work? This, um, this goes back to the pre and post uh, um, activities of daily living. And here again, we can see that with greater diagnostic severity and holding the physical impairments at the same level, basically soft tissue injury, we can see again the impact of the major depression, the worsening psychological state. Which means that it gives insurance adjusters don't understand, but this person had a $500 accident and it was just, it was just whiplash injury. You know, why, why are they getting worse over time? So this tells us one thing about what the worst thing is typically all about, it's about the psychological sequelae, but it's only soft tissue injury. But we know that 30% of folks, even with soft tissue injury, at two years don't make a full recovery. And if my job depends on a full recovery, relative to those physical impairments, it's a loss. I'm gonna to start to develop depression and maybe all those other things that we talked about, the psychosocial sequelae, 
uh, family impacts, uh, income impacts, uh, and the like become uh, quite concerning and, and quite prevalent. We see again this, this uh, trajectory that over the course of, uh, of time, uh, the emotional impacts become more substantial. And, and again, sorry, this is more about when you take major depression, and relatively speaking, um, it's the emotional, um, emotional uh, uh, domain that becomes more impactful on them over time. This is relative to activities of daily living again, from no diagnosis to, uh, to adjustment disorder and, and major depression. And again, we seem to see the same kind of, of trend that's, uh, that's occurring. So basically meaning that the greater the psychopathology, the greater the activity of daily living uh, impact uh, for the individual. Now what's curious here, and I think this is a really important thing that we bring into the into the um, malingering literature is that folks who have no psychological diagnosis, where are their impairments? Okay, so they're still experiencing um, some impairments in terms of, for example, uh, cleaning. Okay, that's a big departure. Home maintenance as well as social and recreational, there's, there's also, in terms of social and recreational, a shortfall. So in, in other words, even though these people don't have a psychological uh, diagnosis, we're seeing that the issues are mainly physical issues, and they're still having an impact on things that aren't having anything to do with malingering. Well, Maybe you could say the person doesn't want to do the home cleaning, they want their partner to do that. Or maybe you could say that, you know, um, they're not doing their, their laundry or their shopping. But the things, in other words, the things that are more physical daily life activities are the things that are being affected. So as a psychologist, how can I possibly call somebody a malinger or an exaggerator if I don't have the tools to measure what's happening to them physically in their physical world because of their physical injuries. It's no diagnosis, I've got nothing to say. <laughs> but physically there's stuff that's, that's going on. So A, I think we need to, to bring this into our, our world. We have to have a better understanding of what's going on. Not, not that we can rule on it, but at least we have a better understanding. And we know that if we know the literature, that the literature says that a good portion of these folks won't make a full recovery. How can we make these determinations strictly on the basis of, of physical, sorry, based on, of, of psychological measures and these measures of motivation or, uh, or of malingering? The same thing is, is true in terms of the rehab checklist. So again, it's, it's sports and hobbies that these folks are seeing really substantial impairments in. Household chores again, uh, regular employment again, so we're missing, a, even though the person is here, ultimately because of their initial physical injury or impairment, as psychologists, it's like, we're not considering at all. We're strictly saying, well, the person must be malingering because they have, there's no diagnosis and because they have some elevations on certain, quote, malingering scales. I don't think we have any right to say that until we understand what's, and fully consider what's going on uh, physically for them especially when 30% or so of folks with minor soft tissue injuries don't make a full recovery. Very last point that I want to uh, uh, bring about is um, we had looked at just the RSOPAC. Um, this is the dimension of, of symptoms, uh, coping uh, physically, cognitively, emotionally, and, and intensity. And basically, this is a study of uh, Dr. Slinsky, actually, who uh, with uh, 59 uh, consecutive uh, rehab patients and his, uh, his outcomes. And I won't get into what the data says, um, the details of the data, but basically as an external uh, consultant, hate to say, but a uh, uh, York University uh, statistician. That's okay, isn't it? Can I say that? Yeah. <laughs> That northern campus. <laughs> so here are 59 patients undergoing treatment with uh, Dr. X. The mean column represents post 
and pre-RSO, Rehab Survey Problem Scores. T-test results for the main variables appear below these descriptive stats. I have found it convenient and most acceptable in circles to express differences in terms of effect size Cohen's G using pooled variance. The overall results approach large effect size as defined by Cohen uh, 0.80, and many if not most are at least modest effect sizes with small defined at 0 0.20. Essentially these are uh, standard deviation units of change done I would conclude that this is sensitive measure and that Dr. Slinsky gets good results. So we have finding, I didn't go through all of our static um, reliability and validity data, of which there is a, a good amount. Um, I forgot to pass these along. These are all of the, uh, the technical manuals for uh, all these measures. But we're also now developing the dynamic measures and demonstrating the effectiveness of these tools relative to uh, to change, they all have built-in behavioral criteria um, relative to the degree of independent uh, living, coping capacity, baselines relative uh, to work. So the interpretation isn't just a question of a T-score or a standard score, it's actually based on some type of grounded behavioral type of uh, unit uh, for consideration. 